Thank you. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 17219 in the name of Graham Day on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on the timetabling of amendments at stage three for the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill. Can I ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now? No one has indicated. I call on Graham Day to move the motion, Minister. Moved, Presiding Officer. The as no one has uh, asked to speak against the motion, the motion, the question is that motion 17219 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed. The next item of business is stage three proceedings on the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill. In dealing with amendments, members should have the bill is amended at stage two, that is SP Bill 34A, the marshalled list, and the groupings of amendments. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division in the afternoon. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. I know you're taking this all down, hand, writing it all down as I say it carefully, yes. Therefore, I will allow a vote. <laughs> you are, Cabinet Secretary, I'm so impressed. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. The members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshal list of amendments. Turning to amendments, Group 1, taking evidence by Commissioner presiding over a ground rules hearing, I call Amendment 2, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, Hums, a use of group with Amendments 3, 4, 5 and 6. And I would ask the Minister, Ash Denham, to move Amendment 2 and speak to all the amendments in the group, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The amendments in this group are all of a technical nature. Section 5 of the Bill makes provision for taking evidence by Commissioner. It introduces the requirement for there to be a ground rules hearing before evidence is taken by a commissioner. Depending on the circumstances, the ground rules hearing may be presided over by the commissioner or by another judge of the High Court or another sheriff. The amendments in this group do two things. Firstly, they improve the drafting by making it more precise. The references in section 5 to a judge are wide enough to include a sheriff too, so it's not necessary to use the word sheriff as well as judge. And secondly, they ensure that in a case where a ground rules hearing is not presided over by the commissioner, it is presided over by a judge of the court which appointed the commissioner. Amendment 2 removes the reference to a sheriff because a reference to a judge is sufficient to include a sheriff. It also clarifies that the judge who presides over a ground rules hearing is to be a judge of the court which appointed the commissioner. Amendments 3, 4 and 6 remove references to sheriff because the references to a judge are sufficient to include a sheriff. Amendment 5 is a minor adjustment to improve the precision of the drafting. And I move Amendment 2, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. No other members indicated they wish to speak. Minister, I take it you don't want to wind up. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Call Amendments 3, 4, 5 and 6 on the name of the Minister and all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move these amendments 3 to 6 on block. Formally moved, Presiding Officer. Does any member, does any member object to a single person? Be, a question being put on Amendments 3 to 6. No. Uh, the question is that Amendments 3 to 6 are agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Group 2, report on operation of sections 1 and 5. I call Amendment 1 in the name of Liam Kerr on its own. Liam Kerr, please do move and speak to Amendment 1. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Members may recall that at stage 2 of this process, I lodged an amendment seeking to implement a review of the operation of this Act. There was a good and incisive debate around this, which included the Cabinet Secretary not only making persuasive points, but undertaking to work with me and other interested members to create something that would achieve the goals that we all felt were worthy. And I'm pleased to report that that engagement took place and I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary and the Government staff for working collaboratively to put together the amendment today. It is a good amendment and I move it in my name. The purpose of Amendment 1 is to require the Scottish Ministers following consultation with key stakeholders to conduct a formal reporting review of the operation of this Vulnerable Witnesses Act once it's in place. As drafted, there are two elements to this review. Firstly, a qualitative review as to whether the pre-recording reforms in the legislation have helped witnesses participate effectively in the criminal justice system. And secondly, that certain data must be included 
to show how many child witnesses have actually benefited from these reforms. Now, the review period covers the three years from the commencement of pre-recording for child witnesses under this Act. By way of clarity, the draft implementation timetable indicated that pre-recording for child witnesses will start in January 2020, and that should mean that the report of the review would be published by the end of 2023. Now, subsection 2 sets out the information that the report must include, but it doesn't prevent the provision of any additional data that might be appropriate, recognising the need to maintain the principles of the independence of our courts and the protection of sensitive details of individual cases. And finally, this amendment also requires ministers to set out the next steps for commencing the pre-recording rule to any purposes or groups for whom it has not yet been commenced, for example, to extend the rule to adult deemed vulnerable witnesses. Uh, it is a good amendment, President Officer, and I do move it in my name. You moved it twice, but that's not a problem. That's fine. Uh, Daniel Johnson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd just like to uh, uh, rise briefly to, to uh, voice my support to this amendment. I think what's been clear throughout the passage of this bill is that this bill is progress, but it is not the finished article that we must continue to make progress in, in all these regards in terms of protecting vulnerable people as they interact with the criminal justice system. And so therefore, I think this review is a really important step to ensuring that we do see the progress that we all hope that this bill will bring. And I think in particular, the, the points around recording qualitative evidence, around the actual effect and impact that these uh, measures would have on vulnerable witnesses uh, in the court system, I think is particularly useful. And so for all of these reasons, um, uh, we will be supporting it. Thank you. Fulton McGregor. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Officer. I didn't expect to be called that quickly there, and thank you very much. I just also uh, want to um, rise in support of the, um, of the amendment put forward um, by my colleague. I think that um, it's something that he raised continually um, during the, the stage two proceedings, and I think it's credit to him that he's worked with the government to bring forward an amendment that works. I believe that it will that the review will demonstrate that a lot of uh, children, young people, uh, and vulnerable others will be helped by this by the passage of this bill. Thanks. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful to Liam Kerr for bringing forward this, uh, what I think is an important amendment. And I know that um, had the Cabinet Secretary been leading the discussion here today, he would have wanted to place on the record his appreciation for having had the opportunity to work with you and others, as you mentioned, um, to ensure this amendment appropriately reflects the strong views that were ex expressed on this at stage two for a mechanism to deliver a more formal review of this bill. I believe that we all recognise that we must be able to measure the extent to which the objectives of this bill have been delivered, everyone impacted by the bill would expect nothing less. Being clear about our intent and how we're going to monitor and also evaluate are absolutely fundamental to that goal. The government is absolutely committed to a transparent process and it's right that this parliament should want to be kept fully updated as these reforms progress. I also acknowledge the fact that the provision has been drafted to ensure it doesn't impact on the independence of our courts in relation to individual cases. I believe this amendment reflects how we've been able to be pragmatic and achieve consensus throughout the passage of this bill. And on that positive point, I thank Liam Kerr for his amendment and I am happy to accept it. Thank you. I call Liam Kerr to wind up, please, Mr Kerr. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I have nothing really further to add other than to thank colleagues for their comments and to uh, endorse what's been said. Press or withdraw? Press. Thank you. The question is, Amendment, um, amendment 1 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. We now move on to Group 3, Report on Process for Taking Evidence from Child Witnesses in Criminal Proceedings. I call Amendment 7 in the name of Margaret Mitchell on its own. Ms Mitchell to move and to speak to Amendment 7, please. <laughs> Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Amendment 7 focuses on ensuring progress towards Scotland moving closer to the Barnahoos model. In particular, it responds to and addresses the comments made by the Cabinet Secretary at Stage 2 when I lodged a probing amendment on the same topic. Specifically, the amendment provides that three months after the Bill has received royal assent, there must be a review of the Government's progress towards adopting the Barnahus principles, and at six monthly intervals thereafter, until the Parliament is satisfied that matters have been sufficiently progressed. Those matters to be progressed 
in taking evidence from child witnesses in criminal proceedings are listed as progress in accommodation other than court buildings that provides such other support to child witnesses as is considered appropriate in as few intervals, uh, interviews as possible, shorthand for moving towards the forensic interview. The committee in its stage one report made it crystal clear that it is essential to ensure that this issue and making pro progress towards a Scottish Barnhus remains on the agenda for the government in this session and, cruci and crucially also at the start of the next parliamentary session for the incoming government after 2021. The amendment also makes provision for the parliament to remain informed about the development of the interview process and the progress being made towards achieving a one forensic interview before the end of this parliament. The Minister will be aware that the Cabinet unanimously agreed on working towards implementing the principles of Barnhus. Our Stage 1 report states, the Committee recognises that there is no single model of a Barnhus and acknowledges that its implementation would have to be adapted in the context of Scotland's adversarial criminal justice system. However, the Committee does not consider that this would prevent the Scottish Government from moving towards full implementation of the Barnahus principles and specifically a one forensic interview type approach. I therefore hope members will support this amendment to ensure that prog progress to achieve this objective is monitored, reviewed and brought back to the Parliament in this parliamentary session and in the next one. I move Amendment 7 in my name. Thank you very much. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Ms Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I rise to speak against Amendment 7 from Margaret Mitchell, which I believe is well-intentioned. The Committee fully supports the Barnhouse model of a child-friendly, one-forensic interview uh, way of taking evidence from children being introduced in Scotland. Personally, I would like to see it happen tomorrow. However, Amendment 7 is not helpful as part of this bill. It assumes an obligation to move towards a new model when no such obligation is introduced by the bill. Indeed, no evidence was taken from stakeholders who would implement this. The Scottish Government is currently taking forward work with stakeholders to consider how the model could operate in Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary wrote to the Committee with a clear timeline of how the work would progress along with Health Care Improvement Scotland and the Care Inspectorate. Commenting in the bill, Children First said, we're pleased that the Cabinet Secretary has set out a clear timetable for the next stages of delivery of the Barnhouse approach in Scotland and the recognition of the need for a fully co collaborative approach. We welcome the commitment made during Stage 2 discussion of the bill to review the progress that's been made by the government and government agencies after the bill has received royal assent. Presiding officer, there's no correlation between the subject of the reporting requirements set out in the, the amendment and the objectives set out in the bill. It would introduce an onerous six-monthly reporting requirement with no clear end date. The amendment seeks that this duty would continue until Parliament was satisfied that sufficient progress had been made. It doesn't set out how any mechanism or threshold uh, would allow Parliament to identify whether this had been achieved. Meeting this indefinite, indefinite reporting requirement would divert government resource away from work to progress the Barnahus concept, concept in Scotland, which is well underway. The amendment also specifies that ministers must consult with child witnesses in preparation of these repeated reports. But most importantly, in my view, asking child witnesses to revisit their experiences risks re-traumatising them and they would have no knowledge of or experience of the new model that is the subject of the questions. Also, this obligation is likely to be practically difficult and perhaps legally impossible due to data protection issues associated with accessing and retaining details of child witnesses and contacting them without the consent of them and their carers. There's also a technical flaw in the definition of child witnesses as the amendment refers to the 1995 Act, a term not defined in the amendment eh, nor the bill. Can I conclude by thanking Margaret Mitchell as Convener of the Justice Committee for her enthusiastic support of the Barnhouse model and can I ask her not to move Amendment 7 for the reasons I've outlined?
Well, she's moved it, so you can't do that. Uh, I now call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Mr Johnson. Th thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I, I'm somewhat conflicted uh, as I rise to speak because I agree with everything in terms of what uh, Margaret Mitchell said. I think she's absolutely correct in stating that we need to uh, uh, maintain focus on the development of the Barnahus model and ensure that it's delivered as quickly as possible. However, I disagree with how she sets out uh, to do so in her amendment. I think in particular, as Rona Mackay set out, the six-month reporting periods are unduly onerous and may indeed be counterproductive, just in, simply in terms of the, 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 the effort um, that would be required in order to do that. And, and indeed, uh, while I understand the threshold applied in terms of uh, the satisfaction of Parliament, I'm not entirely clear precisely what would satisfy that in practical terms, potentially leading to future disputes, which I don't think would be helpful. So, uh, 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 with, for those reasons, we'll be uh, voting against uh, the amendment should the member choose to press it. However, what I would do is ask the government to reaffirm its commitment to that model and pre perhaps provide further detail how that work is progressing um, at the earliest available opportunity, either in response to this uh, amendment or indeed uh, through the course of the Stage 3 debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. Fulton McGregor. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And um, just to, to back up what Rona Mackay and to a certain extent, Daniel Johnson uh, have said I uh, also want to speak against uh, this amendment. I think the Barnhouse uh, concept was the, probably the most defining feature of taking uh, the bill through and uh, the, the committee's trip to, to Oslo uh, was very valuable indeed. And I know that we all want to get there, we all want to get to Barnhouse, but I think that this, um, this particular amendment puts undue pressure on the government who the Cabinet Secretary has written to the the, the, the committee and outlined plans to get there, which includes tackling the various uh, different legal challenges that we heard about. And I know that the convener uh, does uh, understand as well and, and has mentioned herself. So uh, I think as well, just as Ronnie Mackay said, I won't overdo the point, but the re-traumatisation of children, we just, we, I mean, we couldn't, I don't think it's, it's, it's um, acceptable to vote for this today, given that that could be a, um, a, an outcome. So I would also uh, encourage colleagues to reject this amendment, but to not mistake that it's not been supported for the Bar of the Barnhouse uh, concept, which we all want to get to. Minister. Thank you. I'm grateful to Margaret Mitchell for her continued commitment to achieving progress and ensuring children's evidence is taken in an appropriate setting where the right support is available. And as the Cabinet Secretary has said to the Parliament throughout the passage of this bill, a Scottish version of the Barnhouse concept is the Scottish Government's intended destination. And this bill is an important initial step towards that destination. We are committed to making progress towards a truly trauma-informed, recovery-focused response to child victims. However, whilst I understand the positive sentiments behind this amendment, I don't believe that the overarching reporting requirement set out by this amendment is the right way to deliver that progress. In order to meet the requirement as drafted in this amendment, resource would be focused on indefinite, repeated, short-term reporting to Parliament on where and how often children's evidence is being taken. We believe that resource would be better directed to delivering such improvements holistically in the context of the expertise of those interviewing children, but also the quality of the wraparound care and support provided to them and their families. The amendment as drafted would also introduce a statutory requirement for ministers to consult with child witnesses in the preparation of reports. Clearly, the voices of children and young people themselves are crucial in shaping how Barnahus should operate in Scotland. But I am very concerned that introducing a statutory obligation to consult highly vulnerable child witnesses in the preparation of frequent repeated reports could have some troubling consequences. We have heard clear evidence during the passage of this bill about re-traumatising um, the impact that repeated retelling of their experiences can have on vulnerable child witnesses. And it's important that wherever possible, we try to remove and not add to that burden. In addition, it's highly likely that data protection issues would pose a barrier to accessing details of child witnesses whose evidence had been pre-recorded. And even if it was possible, the amendment would require ministers to consult these vulnerable children who are currently going through giving evidence in our criminal courts 
about what they think about progress towards a different system. At such a difficult time in their lives, this does not seem at all appropriate. I'm sure this was not the intention behind Margaret Mitchell's amendment, but we believe that would be its effect. I understand and commend the intention to ensure that children's voices are heard, but particular care is required in how we achieve that. I believe that the answer to develop our approach on Barnhouse in partnership with organisations which support children and their families every day, such as Children First. I want to let them tell us how best to engage with and include children's views. And for that reason, we are providing funding to Children First to support work on participation and children's rights, which will help shape our approach to Barnhouse. As the Cabinet Secretary set out in his letter to Margaret Mitchell last week, work is now underway by Healthcare Improvement Scotland and the Care Inspectorate to develop Scotland-specific standards that will set out the roadmap to Barnhus. This work is now at the scoping stage. A stakeholder event will take place in summer this year and we will be sharing draft standards for wide consultation at the end of the year. At stage two of the bill, the Cabinet Secretary committed to keeping Parliament up to date on progress uh, on this work as um, requested by Daniel Johnson in his contribution just a moment ago. So I will repeat that commitment today. We will come back to Parliament on progress before the end of this parliamentary session. And this will be in addition to the regular updates that we will provide about the progress of the Victims Task Force, which will give Parliament a full picture of all the work underway to improve victims' journeys through the justice system. We have listened to the strong views of the Justice Committee on the benefits of the Barnahus concept, and I am grateful for our consensus around the need to transform how we respond to child victims and witnesses. I don't believe that this amendment will achieve that transformation. Instead, it would mean that rather than progress being made towards this important objective, resources would be focused on a constant cycle of consultation to prepare a report every six months, with the unintended consequence that this would take up the majority of time. So it would greatly reduce the actual real progress that could be made. What is needed now is careful work across justice, across child protection, health and the wider legal community. And we are beginning that work as we move towards a Scottish version of Barnhus, starting with the improvements in this bill. Uh, I hope that what I've said today makes my commitment to that very clear. And on this basis, I would ask Margaret Mitchell not to press her amendment. Thank you, Margaret Mitchell. To wind up, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I thank all the uh, members who have spoken for their comments. I have to say I'm somewhat puzzled with uh, Rona Mackay's po um, comments, uh, which Fulton McGregor supported, in terms of um, stakeholders not being consulted on the Barnhouse model and the one forensic interview, as we took so much evidence, and I can't think of anyone we took evidence that wasn't in favour of the forensic interview and moving to uh, a Scottish barn house as soon as we possibly could. And um, I note the, the Minister refers to the timetable set out by the Cabinet Secretary. Unfortunately, that only goes to summer next year and um, falls well short of, of even um, making sure before the end of the year means at the very end of 2001. And crucially, what it doesn't do is continue putting this on the agenda and ensuring it's there for any incoming government after the 2001 parliamentary elections. Fulton McGregor. Fulton McGregor. Thanks uh, to Margaret Mitchell for taking that intervention. I think every, I, I said earlier, and I think everybody said that, that every supporter of, of the Barnhouse concept, and I know that the stakeholders are as well, but is the member saying that the stakeholders, all the stakeholders that presented to committee uh, in agreement with her amendment? I'm just checking, I heard correctly, was it 2001 or 2021 you said? Um, 2021, oh, I should have said, if I said 2001, Thank we're you. going back in time, um, Deputy Browning Officer. Um, my amendment is looking for the one forensic interview, interview to be introduced as the best way possible to ensure that children are not, and other vulnerable witnesses, are not re-traumatised -tra time and again by having to give evidence and um, moving towards the Barnhouse movement. 
all the, the, the stakeholders who gave in to uh, evidence were in favour of that. So by extension, I um, contest that. If you, if you excuse me, I'd make some progress on, on this point. By extension, then, it seems to me really important that the, 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 the committee follows through on its, com com its commitment to make sure this happens as soon as possible. Turning to um, Daniel Johnson's concerns about the consultation uh, process, twice a year, um, does not to me seem unduly onerous given that consultation, consultations can take many forms and it's involving the Crown Office, Procurator Fiscal, people who are engaged in this whole process um, on a daily basis, Police Scotland, the Scottish Courts Tribunal se se uh, Service and vulnerable witnesses. Now, I notice that people are saying that would re-traumatise -tra vulnerable wit witnesses. I think um, the people doing the consultation have the wit not to be making them talk about the experience before, but rather to move on to see how they found um, the experience of um, generally where the, the evidence was, was taken. I don't see that as being insurmountable. What I do see as a far bigger um, risk is that, as with so much legislation in this parliament, this is very much resource intensive. There are already legislation being passed, or it has already legislation been passed, which is not resourced at present. And the danger is with so much other legislation, we make a provision, we do an excellent report, and then very gradually it slips off the agenda and is forgotten about. And it's for that re reason. And to do the very best for vulnerable witnesses, um, children, and um, all the others who may be phased into this that I intend to press my amendment today. Thank you very much. The members pressed for amendments. So the question is that amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. As this is the first division of the afternoon, the Parliament is suspended for five minutes.
Thank you. We'll now proceed with the division on Amendment 7. This is a 30-second division, so members should cast their votes now, please. Result of division, they voted yes, 29, no, 82. There are no abstentions. Therefore, that amendment is not agreed, and that ends consideration of amendments. If you'd leave the chamber quietly, please. As members will be aware at this point in the proceedings, the presiding officer is required under standing orders to decide whether or not, in his view, any provision of the bill relates to a protected subject matter, that is, whether it modifies the electoral system and franchise for Scottish Parliament elections. In the case of this bill, the presiding officer's view is no provision of the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill relates to a protected, it's a funny idea leaving quietly, relates to a protected subject matter. Therefore, the bill does not require a supermajority to be passed at stage three. Right, now move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 17210 in the name of Ash Denham on the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill. Can I invite those members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Ash Denham to speak to and move the motion. Minister, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So I'm here today because the Cabinet Secretary's paternity leave started unexpectedly early. And I know that the Parliament will want to join me in congratulating him and his wife on the birth of their daughter. <laughs> The Cabinet Secretary has asked me to, on his behalf to thank the members and the clerks of the Finance and Constitution Committee, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, and in particular the convener and members of the Justice Committee for their thoughtful and diligent consideration of this bill. As always, we are grateful to all organisations and individuals who gave evidence both during the government's consultation and then laterally to the Justice Committee. This has been vital, and it has helped shape not just this bill, but other related non-legislative work. And I would also like to thank our justice sector partners who worked closely with our officials to inform both the policy development and also the practical implementation of the bill. The reforms in this bill will make important improvements to how children, initially in the most serious cases, are able to give evidence on often distressing and traumatic experiences. It will lead to many more now being able to record their evidence at an early stage and not having to await the actual trial. And it is right that we support these witnesses to give their best evidence in appropriate surroundings whilst ensuring that the interests of accused persons are also rightly protected. And these reforms do just that. I am grateful for the constructive scrutiny and support that these proposed changes have received from members of this parliament as this bill progressed. I believe it has been an excellent example of all parties working together on a consensus basis to make these proposals as effective as possible. It's also important to acknowledge again the impressive work carried out by Lord Lady Dorian and the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service in their evidence and procedure review. That work began in 2015, so it has been quite a journey to get to this point. But it started what has been a vital debate on whether more could be done to utilise the existing special measures and also technology to improve how we take evidence. As one of the review's immediate outputs, a new High Court practice note 
on evidence by a commissioner is already being shown to have a positive Im impact in practice. The Justice Committee's Stage 1 report was very detailed and brought to the fore a number of important issues. Firstly, while we're all keen to see the greater use of pre-recording rolled out as quickly as possible, it was helpful to reach an agreed understanding that given the scale of these reforms, a phased implementation approach is sensible. The committee emphasised the need for careful monitoring and evaluation of each phase and to be kept informed of the outcomes of those evaluations and a more detailed implementation plan as they are developed. I know the Cabinet Secretary is in full agreement with the importance of doing so and will keep the committee updated throughout the implementation of these reforms. In terms of Minister, case, I think you're a very clear speaker, but according to broadcasting, if you move your microphone a little closer. I will, Presiding Thank Minister. you very much. Thank you. In terms of the phased implementation, this new pre-recording rule will apply to child witnesses in the most serious cases first, with the clear intention to extend to adult deemed vulnerable witnesses in the future. At introduction, the offences to which the new rule applied were quite significant, but the committee's in-depth scrutiny and the stage one debate made very persuasive arguments that the offence of domestic abuse should be added to the list. This major addition was made at stage two and I consider it has been a very important addition to the bill. And the cabinet secretary thanks you all for making such a compelling case and for enhancing these reforms further. But as with most criminal justice reforms, we must ensure we get the right balance for victims, for witnesses and for accused persons. Concerns were raised by some in the legal sector that the reforms may prevent the cross-examination of child witnesses. This was never the intended effect of the bill's provisions, but it was an important issue as we do not want uh, any concerns to undermine the legal sector's support for these changes. So the Cabinet Secretary was happy to propose an amendment to clarify the point at stage two and was grateful that it was then supported in committee. The passage of the bill to date has also focused attention on the development of the Barnahus concept in Scotland. And the Cabinet Secretary recently wrote to the Justice Committee updating on our work in this area, which I trust has been helpful. There is clearly much more to do, but I think we now have a great basis for us all to work together to continue to progress this vital area of work. This bill marks a major milestone of which I believe we can all be proud. And so I move that the Parliament agrees that the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call Liam Kerr. Mr Kerr, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to open for the Scottish Conservatives and more so to speak in favour of passing the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill. In short, the fundamental principles of this bill are ones which I think it's fair to say all parties and members were able to unite behind. It was clear from the evidence that we heard throughout the, that the current system for taking evidence from children is less than ideal. Indeed, I recall in our committee report, Children First, suggesting the current system was Victorian. Well, it certainly became clear from the evidence that currently too many victims and witnesses of crime find themselves re-traumatized by the court's process and can often suffer greater trauma and harm. And it became clear throughout that the provisions in this bill should reduce that distress and trauma caused to the child witnesses through given evidence, as well as improving the quality of justice. And it does that because at its core, the bill is about improving the experience and evidential strength of children and vulnerable witnesses in the criminal justice system. It will ensure children only have to give evidence in court in exceptional cases and enables the greater use of pre-recorded evidence because its key provision is that when a child witnesses to give evidence in serious criminal proceedings for one of a, a set list of offenses, the court must enable all of the child witnesses evidence to be given in advance of the hearing. The Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service described this as a critical step in improving both the experience of witnesses and the quality of justice. They clarified that to the committee by saying, justice will be best served if young and vulnerable witnesses could give evidence in a way that maximized the chances of it being comprehensive, 
reliable and accurate and minimized any potential further harm or traumatization from the ev evidence giving process itself. And let us note the Scottish Court Services Evidence and Procedure Review that the Minister talked about earlier, in which it was suggested that, particularly for young and vulnerable witnesses, traditional examination and cross-examination techniques are a poor way of eliciting comprehensive, reliable and accurate accounts. Now, Parliament will recall that whilst the principles of this bill were sound, there were a number of areas that required review at stage two. And Parliament will be pleased to note that as requested by the committee and many stakeholders, the Cabinet Secretary amended Section 1 to include child witnesses in domestic abuse cases, and I very much align myself with the Minister's comments on this earlier. The Cabinet Secretary also amended the bill to put it beyond doubt that prior statements could be cross-examined. Now, this amendment enables any party to the proceedings to have the court authorise the holding of a commission, which might be used where new evidence comes to light after the prior statement has been taken. And as we've already heard today and agreed to, I have, by working collaboratively with the government and colleagues across the chamber, secured an amendment that compels the government to formally review the operation and extent of success of the Act. Now, I also sought at stage two to amend the bill to ensure that victims were given necessary support after the commission has taken place. And I maintain this is the right thing to do, but Parliament may be interested to know that Lady Dorian expressed concern in a letter to the committee that this shouldn't be the role of the judiciary. It's a very fair comment and following assurances from the Cabinet Secretary that the issue would be addressed by the Victims Task Force, I decided not to press the amendment. So this absolutely is a step in the right direction, but that is what it is, a step. There are further actions worth exploring which may be brought out in the debate today. Firstly, I reiterate my colleague Annie Wells' call earlier this year to trial a one-sheriff system for domestic abuse victims. As it stands, the entirety of a domestic abuse case and related proceedings could be heard by various judges, especially if civil courts become involved in the event of a, a subsequent divorce or child residence arrangements. Uh, this has been successfully implemented in parts of the US and Australia, so I think steps should be taken to minimise what victims have to relive by requiring them to tell their story only once to a single judge. And I know that many speakers today will no doubt address the Barnahus model. For those listening to this debate who may be unaware, in its simplest terms, because as Margaret Mitchell quite rightly pointed out earlier, there's no single model of Barnahus. Uh, it is a child-friendly house which deals with criminal investigation, child protection, physical health, including forensic examination, mental health and well-being, and recovery and support needs, including family support. And the beauty is that this is a multidisciplinary approach, which means that all services are provided under one roof with relevant professionals coming to the child. But perhaps the most important thing is that a key role of the Barna House is to produce valid evidence for judicial proceedings in a way that means the child does not have to appear in court should the case be prosecuted. Now, as I've made clear previously, I very much align myself with the committee's conclusion that there is a compelling case for the implementation of the Barna House principles in Scotland as the most appropriate model for taking the evidence of child witnesses. And I note the Cabinet Secretary's assurance that that is the Scottish Government's preferred direction of travel. Presiding Officer, this chamber is called today to indicate its support for the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill. It's clear that it's a start but it is the right start. It is clear that pre-recording evidence of children and adult vulnerable witnesses reduces the stress they go through and can help ensure the most accurate evidence is obtained. For these and many other reasons I, that I look forward to hearing from colleagues throughout the chamber this afternoon, I'm pleased to confirm the Scottish Conservatives will support the passing of the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill at decision time tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Now calling Daniel Johnson. Mr. Johnson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and I too am very pleased to be rising in support of this bill. It's a good bill, it's a good start. I think at this point in time, as we mark the 20 years of this Parliament coming into being, I think it's important to think about what the, the, the things have been done under the devolved settlement. And I think we need to remember that up until devolution, judges were a matter of ministerial appointment. It was in 2002 the Judicial Appointments Board was established by the Labour Lib Dem administration and I think then further put on statute 
uh, by the, the, the SNP Scottish Government. That was a positive step forward. But I think it's also important to emphasise this point at the moment, because I think progress in these matters in criminal justice is important to recognise the importance of the judiciary. So, but it's also important to recognise as legislators that we must work cooperatively with sentences to make sure that we do have progress in our criminal justice system. <coughs> because I think it's important to mark this, to recognise where these changes have come from, because they have come from the courts and the judiciary. And I think it's also important to recognise that some, in some instances, progress will require that to be led by judges and therefore to respect that independence. And so it's with th th this in mind that I make my remarks about this bill, because this is bill, it is progress, because it will lead to better evidence being taken and less trauma being inflicted on those giving that evidence, because ultimately justice must seek to defend and protect the vulnerable, and I think this bill will do that. I think the, 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 the way we have arrived at where we are has been well set out, uh, both by the Minister and indeed by Liam Kerr. So what I would rather do is, is look at how we must move forward from this point. This bill makes a number of provisions which are sound, but we must be a starting point. The practice and, and ground rules hearings in particular, I think we need to focus on. I think many members of the committee were struck uh, by going up to Parliament House and actually seeing uh, pre-recorded evidence. And I think we were struck that it was a different environment. I think it was conducive to providing better evidence, but it still, in the end of the day, uh, ended up with a, a child uh, being cross-examined by two middle-aged men in an, a, a very alien environment. So I think, while we must respect the ground rules hearings for the, exactly the reasons I set out at the beginning, to respect judicial independence, I think we must look at how we can encourage better practice uh, and, and ensure that the ground rules hearings and that evidence is given in the way that I think we all hope it will be. Likewise, much um, uh, thought was given to extending this. I mean, I think we must recognise that in Scotland that we are not necessarily at the forefront in terms of these sorts of measures, in terms of uh, making a provision for vulnerable individuals to give evidence in court. Uh, I, the, 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 I think it's very welcome that the government brought forward amendments to extend this to domestic abuse. And likewise, I note the provisions that it makes for extending this to other persons deemed vulnerable. But what we must do is, is make sure that those provisions are enacted and they are done so in a, as effective and constructive a way as possible. And indeed, I believe my colleague Jackie Bailey will, will speak further on that point. Likewise, I spoke much through stage two about extending that to other types of case. The vast bulk of cases going through our courts will go through sheriff courts. The, the sheriff courts will be unaffected by these. And, and, and I did probe and test this, and I understand that it would have been inappropriate, both in terms of the resource requirements, but also the nature of trials at sheriff court, uh, many of which would be delayed by the requirement for this. But I would question, or at least ask, that we look at the special measures such as they exist in sheriff courts to make sure that they are as, best, as good as they possibly can do be, that they're using the best technology and the best techniques possible. Finally, I would look, like to talk about Barnhurst, and, and indeed, I think we do need to be careful of, of, of buzzwords. Um, Barnhurst is a, an incredibly important uh, uh, concept, an important set of principles, but I think sometimes some of us who are used to talking about these uh, uh, issues and these matters are maybe a little, bit, a little bit too comfortable in using it, because in essence it's not that complicated. What Barnhurst means is about taking interviews as early as possible from vulnerable witnesses, that those interviews are, are taken by specialised individuals with an extensive degree of training. That those interviews are taken in a context that is comfortable for the individual giving that evidence and, and uh, uh, that it is uh, sympathetic to them. And finally, that that interview, wherever possible, is only given once. When you consider that joint investigative interviews uh, can be taken as evidence in chief, I do not believe we are that far away in Scotland from being able to deliver Barnhus through better training for JII, better investment to make sure that there are no technical problems with that evidence, which I believe sometimes can be used, we can achieve that. So we must ensure that we have that progress, and I think we can through uh, collective focus and effort.
Finally, and in conclusion, I would just like to thank the Minister for her letter, setting out much of what she also stated in terms of how the government seeks to progress, in terms of the funding for Children First, who are based in my constituency, uh, and indeed the other uh, uh, measures around uh, consultation and bringing forward standards. I'd like to thank Lady Dorian, amongst other people, for showing such uh, leadership in this, and I look forward to voting uh, for this bill uh, this evening at decision time. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much, Mr Johnson. And I'll call John Finney. Mr Finney, please. Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, President Officer. And uh, um, I'm delighted to say the Scottish Green Party will be supporting this legislation at decision time tonight. And can I thank all the witnesses we heard from, the, the, the clerks, all the people who've contributed by way of briefings. And, and I think it was very detailed scrutiny. And I have to say, as I've said before in this chamber, this parliament is at its very best when committees are working on legislation and, and, and the detailed scrutiny. Now, one of the, the briefings I got was from Children First, and uh, who need no introduction. And I'll just read exactly what they sent me in relation to a case study. Children First worked with a woman in the Highlands and her 15-year-old son. Her son was one of the witnesses when she was the victim of domestic abuse. She says, and I quote, my son is still haunted by the fact that he had to sit in the court, court waiting room. He said it was the worst day of his life. Even though there was a court case, my ex was still trying to harm us all the time. Our lives were very much in danger. <clears throat> my son was terrified that we'd run into my ex at court. His anxiety was going through the roof. He couldn't cope going to college. He was too scared. He didn't leave my side. He had really bad anxiety and didn't sleep throughout the night. I didn't think he'd ever recover, but things are getting better. And children first uh, should be brought in right away and still to the end of court. Children should always know that there's a lifeline. And that sort of indicates to me the trauma that some of us are, are only too familiar with due to the evidence we've taken that um, people face, um, victims of domestic abuse and the children who are involved. So I think everything requires to be child-centered and um, th this, is, this is a very fine piece of legislation. And of course, it's probably not the finished article, it's the direction of travel that, uh, that we're going on will mean there's more to come. I think it's very much to be welcomed that um, our stage one report was responded positively to by the Scottish Government, not least in respect of the issue of the, uh, um, the domestic abuse aspect. Um, so what's the purpose of our, our justice system? Well, self-evidently, it's to, to deliver justice, and that's justice for everyone, including the accused, and sometimes that's forgotten about. So comment has been made about the ability to cross-examine, and that's, that's very important. But what we do know is, uh, even in our adversarial system, that the best evidence is delivered when an oral testimony is a vital part of that. It's best delivered when it, there's, there's comfort. Now, of course, the reality is that court is stressful for everyone. Um, uh, and as I say, we all respond best when the groundwork's been done. Um, and that's particularly the case with children and vulnerable people. Um, the mention has been made of Lady Dorian, and I think we can't underestimate the importance of her intervention in 2015 and, and the practice note. And, and uh, al along with colleagues, we visited the High Court and we saw an example of how uh, commissioning might take place. And, these are all very positive, but of course, people have rightly identified there's already special measures in place. I have to say, there's a, 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 I have a mixed experience of dealing with constituents who've had cause to deal with them. It's not always been the case, and we did hear evidence, particularly again in domestic abuse cases, that things don't always work out. So um, in one of the briefings we received from the Law Society, they talk about a very simple thing, the administration of the process of cases and early intimation that these additional measures are required because sometimes it is the simple things. We can get the top level stuff. It's sometimes the simple that's uh, important. Um, the adverse childhood experiences should be addressed by way of uh, uh, court. They shouldn't be compounded by court attendance. Um, and I suppose it's the extent to which that trauma that's ever present is going to be ameliorated by this legislation. Sorry, President Officer, how long do I have, please? I can be, yes, I'm being told I can be generous. There you are. Do you want me to I be generous, like opinion, Mr. Finney? I always Finney? like to be your generous. That's fine. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Deep President Officer. Um, the, the, the key to, of course, the Barnhouse model is, is in part, as my colleague Daniel Johnson already said, in play in Scotland. We have the, the joint investigative interviews that are undertaken by the police service and social work uh, 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 individuals, criminal justice social workers, and 
we did hear about the challenges about that, about compatibility, but we also heard, and, and thanks to our, uh, our friends in, in Norway for what was a very, very informative uh, visit there to, to see, see one of the houses, uh, was the forensic nature of the interview and the level of training that went into the, to that. So, as with most things, um, it's very important that they're adequately resourced. Like many others, I, I took um, great pleasure in receiving a letter from the Cabinet Secretary on, on April explaining the, the next stages of the delivery of the Barn House model. Um, and I think it's a, a welcome recognition of the collaborative approach that's going to have to take place in involving the Scottish uh, uh, Courts and Tribunal Service uh, to, to make the, the, take us where we all want to go. Um, I'm delighted, as I said before, that uh, the domestic abuse um, uh, uh, cases are, are now covered. We know the, the pernicious effect of the coercive controlling behaviour that can be offset if we can get good evidence. That's what we want. We want the very best in our criminal justice system. Um, this is progress. There's work to go. Thank you very much indeed. And Ms. McArthur, you're looking at me anxiously. I can be generous with you too. Isn't that nice? Uh, you may Thank come you. to regret that, Deputy President <laughs> Officer. Can I um, start by congratulating uh, Hamza Youssef and his wife, uh, Nadia, on the birth of their daughter. Can I say how much I'm looking forward to the 20-page commemorative pullout in the National that must uh, surely coincide with this, uh, with this uh, event? Um, but can I also uh, start by thanking committee colleagues, um, Spice Clarks, uh, and all those who gave evidence to us through the consideration of this bill. Can I also uh, put on record my thanks to the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for the very constructive way in which uh, they engaged with the committee throughout uh, that process. Needless to say, Scottish Liberal Democrats uh, warmly welcome and strongly support the provisions of this legislation, giving children and young people, as well as vulnerable witness, uh, witnesses, greater protection within our criminal justice system. This is not simply in the interests of those victims and witnesses. It is also in the interest of achieving, as others have said, greater fairness and efficiency within the system as a whole. Of course, special measures already exist to enable children and vulnerable witnesses to give their best evidence. However, there's a compelling case to extend and strengthen those measures. Indeed, I would argue that the longer term objective should be to take children out of the courts entirely, a position supported by uh, Children First and many others. I'll develop this uh, point a little uh, further uh, in a minute, but I want first to acknowledge one of the key changes I think the, com the committee acting in unison, as others have said, uh, managed to secure. The process of rolling out these reforms, enabling more extensive use of pre-recorded interviews, uh, ground rules hearings and joint investi uh, investigative interviews, will not be without its challenges. It will certainly put enormous pressure on almost every part of the justice system, from the uh, those in the third sector through to our courts. I think, therefore, the phased approach in this bill, where different categories of case will fall within the scope of the bill over time, is an entirely sensible one. Uh, reflecting on experiencing, ma making sure that lessons are learnt where appropriate before embarking on the next phase makes sense. However, delaying the exclusion of child witnesses giving evidence in domestic abuse cases was never uh, an acceptable proposition and so I'm delighted that the Cabinet Secretary agreed to the committee's recommendation for such witnesses to be included in the first phase of the rollout. Welcome though these changes are, however, they do, as others have said, fall short of where ultimately we need to get to. And again, I want to record my gratitude to those uh, who hosted our visit in uh, Oslo last year to see firsthand how the Barnahus uh, principles are applied in Norway. I firmly believe that this genuinely child-centred and integrated approach to criminal justice is what we must aspire to here in Scotland. I accept that the one forensic interview approach of Barna House uh, may require a shift in legal culture and practice in this country, given our adversarial uh, system, but this is not an insurmountable obstacle. And as NSPCC point out, integrating justice, healthcare, ongoing therapeutic social services, all under one roof in purpose-built child-friendly accommodation is the best, if not only, means of effectively reducing trauma for child victims and witnesses while maximising the chances of capturing their accounts of what has happened. Uh, Lady Dorian's contribution to this debate has been, I think, recognised rightly so by, by everybody, and I wholeheartedly agree with her when she says ways must be found to take evidence from children and other witnesses in an environment and in a manner that does not harm them further but allows their evidence to be given and tested fully and appropriately. Needless to say, I'm particularly uh, interested in how this model might be tailored to work in more rural and island areas. 
But the fact that this has been made such a success of in a country like Norway, um, obviously a, a country uh, with many, many remote rural and island areas of its own, should, I think, give us confidence in this endeavour. So I welcome the commitments made by the Cabinet Secretary at Stage 2 and repeated by the Minister again this afternoon, both to the adoption of a Scottish Barna House model and a review of progress being made towards that goal. This is something I think the committee will take a great interest in and will, I think, keep ministers and other stakeholders feet to the fire. But, Deputy Presiding Officer, let me conclude as I did at Stage 1 uh, by quoting from Children First. A joined-up approach to the care and justice needs of child victims and witnesses through a Barna House or Child's House is the best way to get it right for children from the moment they tell their story, ensuring that the child and their family get the support they need to recover. This will ensure that we have a justice system that is able to do both what is best for children and best for securing <coughs> evidence. The Scottish Liberal Democrats strongly endorse that sentiment and will continue to work with ministers and those across this chamber to make it a reality, hopefully sooner rather than later. But for now, I look forward to voting for the bill later on at decision time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move to the open debate. The generosity just continues. Uh, you, all the members in the open debate, all four of you can have five minutes each if you wish. That's made your afternoon, Ms Bailey. Uh, I call Jenny Gilruth, followed by Maurice Corey. Presiding officer, I am grateful for the opportunity to speak in today's stage three debate, particularly given the legislation passed in this place only 48 hours ago. On Tuesday, we voted to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 8 to 12. And this evening, we will vote to protect child witnesses in the most serious of criminal proceedings. These two pieces of legislation put children's needs at the heart of our criminal justice system. Contrast that with Children First evidence, as previously cited today by Liam Kerr, who told the Justice Committee that Scotland's justice system was inherently Victorian and often caused children greater trauma and harm. So this legislation marks a hugely significant shift, epitomised in Section 3 of the Bill, which states the court must enable all of the child witnesses' evidence to be given in advance of the hearing unless the court is satisfied that an exception is justified under subsection. That use of language is crucial because it denotes a shift in power from Scotland's court system, putting witnesses' needs first. And as we've heard this afternoon, pre-recording evidence for vulnerable witnesses will reduce trauma. It will reduce distress, particularly for children. And I'm proud that the Scottish Government has now also included domestic abuse specifically on the face of the bill. As the committee heard in evidence sessions, this is particularly important given the widening scope of what we now understand to constitute domestic abuse. Of course, pre-recording evidence is important to avoid re-traumatising vulnerable witnesses. And indeed, Lord Justice Clark told the committee when children are asked to give evidence at a time that is remote from the event, not only has their memory diminished, but they are more likely to be confused by general questioning about the incident and in cross-examination might come across often wrongly as being shifty or unreliable. And this is an important point. Pre-recording evidence should expedite the process and avoid the need for evidence to be repeatedly taken from witnesses. The example that always stuck with me was that given to the committee by Daljeet Dagon from Oxfam, who told us of the example of a witness having to give evidence 27 times to the police in total. By the time the trial went to court, she was deemed to be an unreliable witness. That is another reason why this legislation is of such importance, providing better quality evidence. The Scottish Government is taking a phased approach to rolling out the implementation of the pre-recording of evidence, and this indeed is the approach supported by the legal profession. At the beginning, the rule will only apply to certain child witnesses giving evidence in the most serious cases in the High Court. This will allow for those who are most vulnerable to be supported swiftly. Because this isn't simply about installing video recording equipment, it's about challenging an enshrined culture in the legal system, and one which historically has not always put uh, witnesses, and in particular the needs of children, at its heart. Indeed, as the Crown Office told us, phasing will allow the system to absorb change while minimising risk both to the system and to individual cases. Presiding officer, in my contribution to the Stage 2 debate, I raised a link between the Scottish Government's Getting It Right for Every Child Policy, or GERFIC, which is the foundation stone of our education system in Scotland. And I compared the Barna House model, a one-stop shop where services come to the child, to our own GERFIC approach, which is also child-focused. Many schools in Scotland also now have a focus on being trauma-informed, and in Glenrothes, our police officers are embracing the Trauma Teddy Scheme, which provides children with reassurance during or after distressing events. In the Cabinet Secretary's letter to the committee last month, he points to the Government Commissioning of Healthcare Improvement Scotland in partnership with the Care Inspectorate to develop Scotland-specific standards. And I was also glad to hear the Minister mention that in her speech um, earlier on and her commitment to that as well. 
that this is welcome to see the commitment to concrete action, but I again would encourage the government to look at the links between our child-focused education system in Scotland and to ensure that education partners are linked into the development of those standards. Because this can't just be about the justice system if we are to get it right for every child. So let's use the expertise we have in Scotland to build a system which truly supports and protects child witnesses to get the best evidence. And I very much hope that this is exactly what our own Scottish standards for Barnard House will do in the future. Thank you. Maurice Corey, followed by Jackie Bailey. <coughs> thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I too would like to thank everybody involved in bringing the bill to this stage, and particularly the clerk's team. I welcome stage three of this bill to the Chamber. What this bill puts forward, being the pre-recording of evidence of some child witnesses out with the courtroom, is rightfully an important step to take. For the sake of these witnesses, many of whom are victims of atrocious crimes, it is vital that these proposed changes are as effective and sensitive as possible. This bill is a positive move forward, and I join my colleagues in supporting it. I found the findings of the committee to be very sound in its helpful analysis of the bill, and I think it right that some of its recommendations have been listened to and will be adopted. It is this scrutiny that strengthens the possibility of real change to Scotland's justice system. As was generally agreed at stage one, this bill deserves a gradual and careful implementation. It would do no good to overload the court's process without consideration of the detailed planning and resources needed to secure meaningful and effective change, one which balances a fair outcome for the perpetrator with, respe with the respect and support owed to the witness. Of course, we have to be mindful of the different proceedings required and the vulnerable witnesses at the heart of these cases. On a wider scale, this bill has encouraged us to take steps back to consider the best way to take evidence from child witnesses. None of us can condone the risk of vulnerable witnesses feeling targeted or traumatized by the court's process. And as I have said in this chamber before, the quality of their participation is vital to the outcome of the verdict. So, ensuring that evidence is pre-recorded in these cases will allow children of different ages and abilities to a process that offers them the best chance of giving accurate and informative evidence. As the children's charity Bernard has highlighted, and I quote, the better the support which the witness has, the better the evidence they will be giving. But surely, this bill should encourage us to look to future transformations which can go further with this goal in mind, I support the committee's recommendation to explore the case for establishing a Barna House approach in future, which would take into account the importance of having the right services provided to support young witnesses in a child-friendly setting. There is a persuasive argument to say this pathway may be better equipped than a court process in handling children in what can be an intimidating and traumatic experience. Whilst appreciating that this concept would take time to establish, I welcome the government's commitment to provide progress on what a Scottish approach to the Barnhouse-inspired principles would look like in future. And moreover, I'm pleased to see that child witnesses in domestic abuse cases will now be included as a result of the Stage 2 amendment put forward by the Justice Committee. This addition to the bill was much needed especially given the introduction of the Domestic Abuse, bill Scotland, Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill in 2018, as the service assist highlighted in its evidence, which was most insightful. Under this new law, we are expecting to see a rise in the number of children called to give evidence under solemn procedure, a thought which can weigh heavy on the mental health of these witnesses. With this in mind, the expansion of the provision to include domestic abuse cases is absolutely right and vital. Further to this, I believe that in future it is worth exploring a one sheriff system for these victims of domestic abuse. Indeed, if we are looking to stop the re-traumatization for witnesses, surely they would benefit from only relaying their account to one single judge. We have seen how this can work in Australia and the United States, for example. The fact that it might also promote greater efficiency is also worthy of note. So perhaps following this bill, a trial of this system should be the next step. For well, this is how we can make Scotland's justice system work even better for victims. And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, Scotland needs its courts to be of the highest standard possible. For this to happen, we need to restore confidence in the justice process. We cannot lose the scope we have for wider reform than this, that this bill will encourage. 
And indeed, we all want this bill to target some of the gaps and the creaks in our court system. And with careful implementation and a clear view for the future, steps must be taken, and I believe it can. Thank you. Jackie Bailey, followed by Fulton McGregor. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and you and the previous occupant of that chair are nothing if not generous with time. Um, I welcome the bill and its intention to ensure that there is support for children and the most vulnerable in our society at what can be an extremely difficult and often distressing time for them. Um, but it is all about giving the best possible evidence. I understand the immediate focus on children, and I also welcome the amendments made at stage two to include domestic abuse victims. But I want to speak specifically about section three, as this is the part of the bill that deals with other categories of vulnerable witnesses. The criteria, the timing, is entirely in the gift of ministers. I've not heard any indication of a timetable to enact this aspect of the legislation, but I believe this must not be left to gather dust on a shelf. So I would be particularly keen to hear from the minister in her summing up when she will extend measures to other vulnerable witnesses. Um, I am afraid I am slightly less patient than many of my other colleagues in the chamber today. And presiding officer, I want to focus on people with learning disabilities as vulnerable witnesses. As convener of the cross-party group on learning disability, I'm particularly keen to ensure that their voice is heard in every aspect of society, and that includes our criminal justice system. The debate has largely focused on children, and I want to ensure that their views are not overlooked or somehow othered in discussions surrounding the bill. Because after all, according to the Scottish Government's own survey, learning disabled people in Scotland were more likely to be victims of a crime in 2016-17 than non-disabled people. It is a fact that the heightened level of vulnerability that comes with having a learning disability makes some prime targets for criminal acts, anything ranging from small-scale theft to indeed even sexual abuse and rape. It is vitally important, therefore, that their experiences of the criminal justice system are heard. And I would urge the Scottish Government and the Minister to do so when considering the implementation of the bill. The reform that is central to this bill, which essentially mandates child witness statements for serious cases to be given in advance, is absolutely right, but must be extended to those with learning difficulties as soon as possible. Presiding officer, day-to-day -day tasks that may seem easy and even mundane to you and I can be hugely stressful and testing for many with a learning disability. We know that some learning disabilities create real barriers to people feeling comfortable when talking to others or going to new unknown places. Just imagine for a moment the potential trauma that can occur from asking an individual with a learning disability to not only be the center of attention in a courtroom, but to then relive over and over again a horrific crime that they are a witness to whilst being asked often very personal questions by a stranger. The Equality and Human Rights Commission stated that people with learning disabilities can find the court environment very challenging and often don't understand what is being said or what is happening. Prior statement giving completely removes that situation and will allow for everyone to feel as comfortable as possible given the circumstances. The government's policy statement says that extending provisions to other vulnerable witnesses represents a major change and I agree. And they say it will take time, but it would be useful for us to know just how much time, what is the target for implementation, and an assurance that it will not be left on the shelf. Presiding officer, finally, I want to mention the appropriate adult scheme, not directly connected with this bill, but the Scottish Government consulted on this last year, and it's referred to in the policy memorandum. And indeed, the government made a commitment to launch it this year. So can I ask, when is it gonna be launched? In this and in the implementation of the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill. It is essential that progress is made to ensure that the most vulnerable people in Scotland have the protection that they need and deserve, and it's not put off for another day. Thank you. The last of the open debate contributions from Fulton McGregor. 
Thank you, President Officer. Um, and just like it was at stage one, it's, it really is a great pleasure to speak in this debate as we stand on the verge of making it law here at stage three. And I hear what others have said in, in the chamber today about it being a, a start, and I, I, I totally agree with that, especially on the back of Jackie Bailey's uh, main theme of her um, speech there. But it's a very significant start because this is real and proper legislation that will have a positive effect in people's lives and will go some way to rectifying the discrepancies in our current system. Like, for example, the constituent that I mentioned in my stage one speech, and I highlighted um, the situation again to the Cabinet Secretary through portfolio questions just a couple of weeks ago. These are the sort of real life situations that moving forward, it will be helped by the passing of this bill. And I know that, for example, they are continuing to monitor proceedings. I was also, a, as you know, President Officer, a member of the, the Justice Committee, and I think that the argument for this bill and its progression was very much won out at stage one, and I think that you can see that reflected um, here today in the Chamber. And the, the majority of evidence that we heard from stakeholders, including Bernardo's and Children's First, for example, and many others, was the need to reform and the introduction of a rule ensuring that, in the most serious of cases, evidence from a child is taken pre-trial. And I think that also it's worth mentioning that I think that this bill passing today, if that is the decision, which uh, it seems very likely, um, is that there's opportunities as well for, for children from BME backgrounds who we know can possibly face additional challenges um, when going through criminal and court proceedings. Um, but, uh, President Officer's colleagues will know I was particularly pleased that the whole process of this bill uh, moving through the Parliament gave a good airing to the subject of uh, joint investigative inter interviews, something that Daniel Johnson uh, focused on. And several years back as a, a social worker carrying out these interviews and after sitting, sitting through some of these and um, speaking with colleagues afterwards and sharing their frustrations, never you know, in a hundred years would I have thought that of having the opportunity to, to talk about it here today uh, in our uh, national parliament where changes can be made. And that's why through the, the process of this uh, bill that I've welcomed the steps been taken to allow for uh, joint investigative interviews to be used as evidence in chief such as the expanding of training and increasing the number of interviews carried out by an individual practitioner, two areas where we, we heard there was um, difficulties and I think that possibly leading to going down the road of a specialised expertise, if you like, and I think that's something that will get a lot of support uh, for practitioners in police and social work um, out there as well. And I'd also like to, to obviously um, comment on the, the, the issue that um, has perhaps been most prominent in the Bill's passage, and that's uh, Scotland moving to, to a Barnhouse model, as we heard during the, the amendments uh, section of the debate um, today. And I've, uh, I've said before that, and even using my own experience, I feel that we could certainly move to such a model, at least on a practice level, if not a legal one, relatively straightforward. Uh, point that Daniel Johnson, I think, would have noticed I was nodding eagerly when he was making, because um, I think we could uh, interview children, offer support to families and provide health investigations in a, a one-stop, child-friendly environment, rather than the, the current situation, which is a bit um, patchy up and down the country and, you know, d d needing to deal with health professionals and social work and it all happening at different points, which I think everybody accepts isn't in the best interests uh, of children. It brings me to, to, to Margaret Mitchell's amendment. I want to say that although um, you know, I voted against the amendment and spoke against it, I want, I want her to know that I think that it's re really honourable that she's been a, um, a champion for the Barnhouse. House, but I think that her amendment today uh, was, was, a, was a wee bit out of place and I, I couldn't support that. There wasn't reflection given at the various legal um, and technicality issues that I think the Cabinet Secretary and the, the Government need to look at, which are going to be complex, even if I said earlier the practice ones maybe aren't so complex. But most importantly, the, the, the potential for re-traumatisation of children eh, through that amendment was not something that I could vote for. But I do want to still credit the convener of the Justice Committee, nonetheless, eh, for, her, um, for her passion in this area. And I think she's been very much eh, taken on by what she's seen in, in, in Oslo, so, um, as, as we all were. Um, but I do welcome the letter from the Cabinet Secretary to the, eh, the committee outlining there will be a scoping report as early as June this year. Um, and final standards expect, expected by 2020. That is, that's moving really quickly, presiding officer, to my mind, and I think that, that's got to be a uh, welcome. It allows for a collaborative approach, as he says in his letter, to, between Healthcare Improvement Scotland and the Care Inspectorate, bringing in other part, uh, partners as well about how we can uh, manage um, 
uh, or deal with the difficulties in this area, such as pre-recording, for example. Um, and I would just like to end by commending this bill at stage three. Thank you very much. We now move to the closing speeches, and I call Daniel Johnson. I can give you up to five minutes, Mr Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. One of the advantages of both uh, uh, closing as well as opening a debate is that you get to uh, say the things in closing that you either ran out of time or forgot to say. And importantly, I, I think I would just like to mark my uh, uh, congratulations to Mr Yusuf for all the reasons to not be present in the chamber. His is a, a pretty good one. But can I also acknowledge uh, Ash Denham has been left holding this legislative uh, baby uh, while uh, Hamza goes off to hold an actual baby. And I think she's done very well because this is a, a, a technical uh, a, a, a bill and, and one which I think has uh, uh, very much taken everyone into a great deal of detail. Uh, but I think she's uh, done very well. But I think most importantly, and I think one of the key things I, I, I would like to highlight is I think this bill does not stand in isolation. Now, other members have, have uh, mentioned the age of criminal responsibility. Uh, but we also have uh, uh, the, the Management of Offenders Bill, which is, is going through. And this is a bill that can mark progress, but it will only do so if it does in conjunction with others, but not also just conjunction with other legislation, but also other measures. I think if you look at commitments to reducing short sentencing, towards moving towards community justice, it's vital that this measure sits alongside those other measures, but also receives the resource that it needs, resource and investment into the technology and facilities that we need, but above all else, I think, enjoys the confidence of uh, sentences and legislators. I think when we look at the use of community justice sentences in particular, there is undoubtedly an issue around the confidence from sentences in using uh, those measures. And I think what we need to do is have a focus, a holistic focus, to ensure that the, that the measures in this bill gain and enjoy the confidence that it seeks to provide them. Because I think above all else, and to sort of touch on, on what Liam MacArthur said, and I thought he put it very well, what we must aim towards is taking children out of the courts. It is not a place for children. It is a, a place that's only going to serve to traumatise them. And in so doing, I think, undermine the very things that, I, as I set out earlier, that I think we, we should uh, ensure that the justice se system seeks to do in terms of protecting them. And indeed, I think many members from the Justice Committee have highlighted our, our very useful and informative trip to also, and it, it was, it did actually help us bust the jargon around Barnhurst. And what struck me, as clearly struck Fulton McGregor, was that we're not so terribly far away. In taking what we have in terms of joint investigative interviews, in terms of special measures, we see a context in Oslo where they have an adversarial system and they have uh, the system of Barnhurst. And then critically, and I think the, the point that we will need to reflect on, what enables them to protect their adversarial system is the, the possibility of a secondary interview, one which I understand is not all that often used because of the confidence and indeed the professionalism within, with which those interviews take place within uh, the, the Barnhus uh, uh, system in Norway. And that's what we ought to aim towards, a system which can incorporate the adversarial, the important adversarial aspects of our justice system but does so with the confidence of all of those who participate within it, which requires investment, but above all as well as training. And I think the one point, other point from, from that, ob that, that experience was the fact that those police officers, and it is police that undertake those interviews and run the Barnhurst, those police officers have a three-year degree to get them to the specialised training that they require to that. That is what we have to aim towards in Scotland, and I, I fully believe that. I think the other key point, I think, raised in the debate, raised by, I think, both John Finney and Jackie Bailey, is that this is fundamentally about experience and improving experience. And vulnerable people don't know to be traumatised based on where they are or the nature of the crime that might have been committed against them. And I think if there's one possible flaw, and certainly one that, uh, flaw that I reflected on through the passing, is that this bill does, and I understand why, but it defines uh, vulnerable people in it by the type of crime. And a, and a child doesn't know to be traumatised because they're giving evidence under summary or solemn proceedings. That, that's clearly not right. So I think we need to take these principles forward and make sure that they are applied so that we ensure that those experiences are avoided, so that giving evidence is not the worst experience of a child's life, as John Finney put it. But likewise, vulnerability isn't defined by age either. And I thought Jackie Bailey's um, uh, contribution was extremely powerful. Uh, adults with vulnerabilities, adults with learning disabilities, have every uh, uh, possibility, and perhaps in some ways more so, 
of being traumatised by the experience of court. And I think we must ensure that we extend these uh, measures to those vulnerable people as quickly as possible. But likewise, we must make sure that all those people are supported as well. And I think that we must make sure that those supports, those active supports are in place. But above all else, this is about taking people with us. This is about progress. But we must ensure that the sentences and legislators and indeed wider society are taken with us so that we can uh, achieve the benefits and the progress that I think we all hope uh, will be, uh, uh, be, be, be established by the passing of this bill this evening. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I call Mar Margaret Mitchell for around five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The Justice Committee's scrutiny of the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill has proved an excellent example of a parliamentary committee united in its support for and working together to improve legislation. I thank all committee members for their constructive contributions and pay tribute to all the organisations and witnesses who gave invaluable evidence to the committee. And as always, the justice clerks have given the committee superb support and I thank them for that. My thanks also to both the Scottish Tribunal Service and Lady Dorian for arranging a visit to the High Court to see how evidence is currently pre-recorded. The committee visited Barnhouse in Norway and saw firsthand the benefits of providing child witnesses with a dedicated child-friendly facility away from the court with a range of support services under one roof and the one forensic interview approach, which delivers best evidence, reduces and helps recovering from trauma. The committee is extremely grateful to all the staff at Barnhouse Oslo for their warm welcome and for the time spent answering questions and explaining how Barnhouse, the Barnhouse approach secures the best evidence from children to help secure a prosecution. The Bill's main policy objective is to improve how children and vulnerable witnesses participate in the criminal justice system through greater use of pre-recording their evidence in advance of a criminal trial. A new rule provision in the Bill generally requires the most serious cases for all a child's evidence to be pre-recorded. This new rule has major implications for our adversarial criminal justice system and requires a major shift in both legal practice and culture. In view of this, the Scottish Government's based approach to the rules implement implementation makes sense, as does the requirement for detailed analysis of each phase, with the initial phase focusing on child witnesses that's why Liam Kerr's amendment tabled today is so important. As a result of an amendment at stage two, which the entire committee supported, as have all speakers in today's debate, phase one will now also include child witnesses in solemn domestic abuse cases. There were various issues raised by the committee at stage, uh, stage one report and at stage, stages two and three. These included the importance of and necessity for effective interview technique training and the requirement for this to be monitored. To quote the Mental Welfare Commission, a bad interview done earlier is no better than a bad interview done at a trial. In other words, as both Daniel Johnson and John Finney effectively argued, the significance of training for those involved in the joint in investigative interview of a child and other vulnerable witnesses cannot be overstated. There is also the need for measures to support and protect witnesses against harassment or further victimisation throughout the evidence giving process and, and crucially including after giving evidence. Here, this continuing work of the government's new Victims Task Force, looking at ways to improve the experience of victims and witnesses who give evidence, is extremely welcome. It is essential not only to protect them from harm, but also to ensure witnesses are not deterred from giving evidence. 
Finally, Deputy Presiding Officer, the committee emphasised its commitment to move as soon as possible to a Scottish Barnahus model. So whilst I welcome the Cabinet Secretary letter updating the committee on what is planned up to summer 2020, this falls short of providing a timetable of reviews on the face of the bill, which continues to the end of this parliamentary se se session and continues into the new parliamentary session. And I thank uh, Fulton McGregor for his kind remarks, but concur with Jackie Bailey's comments about the necessity for progress and a timetable for Im implementation. In conclusion, I ask the Scottish Government to commit today to providing a substantial resources for new technology necessary to achieve a Scottish Barnahus. In the meantime, the Scottish Conservatives have much pleasure in voting for the Vulnerable Witnesses Scotland Bill this evening. And I call Ash Denham to wind up in this debate and uh, up to six minutes will take us to decision time, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I want to begin my closing remarks by thanking again the very many stakeholders and individuals who have given evidence to the committee on this bill and particularly on the benefits that pre-recording evidence can bring. And I suspect many of them may be looking on to see the conclusion of this debate today. I also thank everyone who's contributed to what has been a very constructive and I have to say well-informed debate this afternoon. It's clear that we are all committed to the key principles that are underpinning the bill. And I consider that this positive approach has been the hallmark of the entire bill process and a true reflection of the professionalism and the integrity of the Justice Committee uh, as is its vigorous examination of the bill and also the amendments. I believe we now have a bill which has broad and indeed significant cross-party support from which we can lay the foundations for further protection of our most vulnerable victims and witnesses. It does, for me, reflect a positive template for managing legislation for the future. That said, we don't doubt the scale of the challenge and the appetite for rapid and early momentum. This legislation prefers the foundations and now is the time for clear progress to deliver these reforms. We will continue to work closely with our justice sector partners and stakeholders to ensure that the reforms work well in practice and benefit these vulnerable child witnesses. And at this juncture, I should put on record again um, the welcome and support to the sentiment behind the review amendment lodged uh, from Liam Kerr. I believe this provides a suitable and sensible mechanism from which we will be able to determine how successful the measures detailed within the bill have been in their delivery. We need to learn from both our successes and from where there is evidence what we could do better. I'm pleased that others in the Parliament today have also seen fit to support his amendment. But that being said, I regret Excuse that me, we Minister. Were uh, could I ask those who are coming into the chamber or who have just arrived to be a bit quieter, please? Thank you very much. Ash Denham. I regret that we were uh, unable to support the amendment from Margaret Mitchell, as we believed that it would have placed an unnecessary and potentially inhibiting legislative burden on to the Scottish Government. And I hope that what I've said today reassures Parliament that we are committed to developing a truly trauma-informed, child-centred response to child victims. I believe that we do have consensus on that, and it will take careful work across justice, health and child protection in the coming months. We will continue to communicate with Parliament and the Committee about progress on Barnhus and key milestones, and I am happy to make that commitment again today. And I will now, if I may, look to address some of the points and the common themes that have emerged from contributions this afternoon. So a number of members um, made mention of Barnahus, as you would expect, including Liam Kerr and others across the chamber. I note the strong interest, um, both in moving towards that as a destination, but also this idea about keeping up the momentum. And I note that that um, came across strongly from the chamber this afternoon. Barnahus, of course, is more than just criminal justice. It is healthcare, it is child protection, 
It involves the legal profession. So it's right that we take the time, both across government and also with our key stakeholders, to develop that Scottish version of the Barnahus model. We have set out a clear timetable to develop those standards for Scotland, and I hope that that reassures the Chamber today that we are committed to keeping up that momentum. Daniel Johnson made a number of points, um, the first of which that this uh, bill, it was echoed by others across the Chamber today, this bill is a really good starting point, and I thank him for that. He also made a point about um, the ground rule hearings and developing them potentially further in the future. So obviously he'll be aware of the latest High Court practice note, sets out a general approach for things like preparing questions in advance for child witnesses, for instance, and obviously the practice note can be updated over time, and I think that does offer an appropriate level of, of flexibility there. Um, and another point that he raised was uh, the point about greater use of, of special measures. And I think it's important that vulnerable witnesses in general are aware of the, the special measures that are available to them. And I think that's an important point. So the Crown Office are now beginning a process of reviewing all the correspondence that are, is issued by VIA and reviewing the information leaflets and so on um, to make sure that they're as understandable and clear as possible so that people have the right information. Um, the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service are, also have a rolling programme of upgrades planned across the estate, and that is to help ensure that technology, which was another point that Daniel Johnson raised, technology and equipment both within the courtrooms and also in the live link TV rooms can help to keep pace with ongoing improvements. Um, I'll turn now to address a couple of points made by Jackie Bailey. Um, changing the way the evidence is being taken for so many needs to obviously be done in a controlled and careful way. So first for child witnesses in the most serious cases, but as noted, the bill does have a framework for extension to other vulnerable witnesses so that over time it can cover more deemed vulnerable witnesses. But it's important that that's done in a managed way, and I'm sure Jackie Bailey would understand this. The draft implementation plan does set out the government's plan for this, and so unfortunately I won't be able to give any commitment beyond that today. Um, moving on to Jenny Gilruth, um, who in her speech made mention of a child witness who was made to give evidence 27 times. And I think this example alone shows us why this bill will be transformative and lead to a better quality of evidence. In closing, presiding officer, I am delighted to have been able to speak to this bill at stage three, as it's clear how important these changes will be. This legislation is a major milestone in ensuring that many more children are able to pre-record their evidence in advance of the actual criminal trial. And I hope that all of us here in the chamber today can support these reforms and we will pass the Vulnerable Witnesses Bill. Thank you very much, and that concludes this afternoon's debate. We're going to turn straight to decision time, and there is one question uh, this afternoon, and that is that motion 17210, in the name of Ash Denham, on the Vulnerable Witnesses Scotland Bill, be agreed. And members should cast their votes now, as this is an Act of Parliament. The result of the vote on motion 17210 in the name of Ash Denham is yes, 112. There were no votes against, there were no abstentions. Uh, the motion is agreed and the Vulnerable Witnesses Criminal Evidence Scotland Bill is passed. And that concludes decision time. I close this meeting. <laughs>